Good evening, everybody. My name is David Brashear. I'm the director of the Muscarelli Museum, and I can tell you, it is really great to see this many people in this building. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Hopefully I'm not breaking. Did I do something? No. Hopefully I'm not breaking anything up here. I do want to invite you to come back in the coming weeks to see our two exhibitions. We have spent a lot of time and energy staging what I think are two really profound collections of art and explorations into the world of art. So downstairs, you're getting a chance to glimpse it tonight, is our exhibition Shared Ideologies. And in Shared Ideologies, we explore the cultural forces that have acted upon contemporary and near contemporary Native American artists. And it gives us an opportunity as well to show our outstanding and growing collection of Native American art here at the museum. So I invite you to come back and take a look at what we have up and the story we're telling here in the Sheridan Gallery and adjacent in our adjacent Spiegel Gallery. And then upstairs, we are commemorating the 20th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. Uh, for many of you in the audience, uh, that's something that you weren't even alive for. But what we've done is looked at it very delicately. We have focused in on the World Trade Center and examined the various iterations of architecture in that plot of land in southern Manhattan. So we start with the World Trade Towers, the Twin Towers, and then of course address the tragedy and the attacks, and then look at the remaking of the World Trade Center site. Most of all, we hope to make that space, those three galleries upstairs, a space for reflection, almost a chapel to think about what happened on September 11th, but it's through the lens of architecture. So please come back. So each semester, we do what we call a Muscarelli exploration, which is a deep dive into some aspect of the world of art. And this fall, we decided to take it directly to the artists and present a series of speakers under our title, The Voice of the Artist. Uh, tonight, of course, we're joined by Ramota, Roberto Hamora, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But we do have two other artists scheduled to join us, and there are two artists that we've really come to know quite well. Um, Cara Romero is a good friend of the Muscarelli Museum now. We have a number of works by her. She's a contemporary Native American photographer who addresses issues in the Native American community. And uh, some of you have probably seen our great work, TV Indians, that we bought into the collection a couple of years ago. But we're debuting a couple of additional works by Cara Romero that we've added into our collection. She's going to be coming to speak here. She's going to be um, here for a week in November. She's going to be speaking on November 16th. And then the following night, her husband, Diego Romero, who is a Native American contemporary ceramicist, uh, he's going to be speaking about what influences his own art. And we may have one or two other artist speakers that come and address the community throughout the semester. We haven't pulled together all of the dates just yet. I'll also invite you to take a look at our newsletter that we publish each semester. It has a number of other of our events for the fall semester um, outlined in there. So if you don't have one, take one home with you tonight. So I will tell you that tonight, after Roberto's presentation, He'll be taking questions, and they'll be moderated by Steve Prince, our director of engagement here at the Muscarelli, and that will be a lot of fun. So now it's my great honor to kick off tonight's program. William & Mary Professor Francis Tanglau Aguas is a remarkable member of our faculty, and he's going to introduce our guest speaker for the evening, Roberto Hamora, in just a few minutes. But before he does, I'd like to tell you just a little bit more about Professor Aglis. He's a widely acclaimed writer and performer and often brings students and fellow members of the William & Mary faculty along in his creative enterprises. This year, Professor Aguas collaborated with diverse alumni and students in creating the multimedia piece, The Untethered, Diverse William & Mary Alumni Tell Their Stories. As a university administrator, Professor Aguas is the founding director emeritus of Asian 
and Pacific Islander American Studies at William and Mary, and was a program director of Africana Studies from 2012 to 2016. He's currently the director of William and Mary's Global Studies. In 2020, President Catherine Rowe appointed Professor Aguas and Professor Denise Sahoni as co-chairs of the Asian Centennial, which is celebrating 100 years of Asian student matriculation here at William and Mary. So please welcome me, join me in welcoming Professor Aguas to the Muscarelli. <laughs> Thank you for that very kind and generous introduction, David. <clears throat> uh, but more so, thank you for welcoming the Asian Centennial and the wide Asian Pacific Islander, Middle Eastern, Southwest Asian community into the warm embrace of the Muscarel community of artists. Thank you very much, Muscarel. It gives me great pleasure to share with you uh, our guest for the evening. Um, first, I will go into the more formal <clears throat> introduction uh, about the artist, and then after that, I will segue into, into my heart, uh, that place where we are art, artists uh, bring our student, uh, bring our work from. So, Roberto Hamora. Roberto Hamora holds the BFA and MFA. His BFA is from Virginia Commonwealth University. His MFA in Fine Arts is from Purchase College, State University of New York. His work touches the soul through the use of color, through the use of shapes. For me, Roberto Hamora makes the abstract real in the hearts of the beholder. That is from my heart. I first met him as an undergraduate when I spoke to the convention of Filipino students on the East Coast after the very sad events at Virginia Tech, 2007. After that event, he emailed me and visited me as an undergrad, as a mentor, as a friend, as a new faculty here. I arrived here in 2005. So I have known Roberto since he was, I think, a sophomore at VCU. And this relationship unfolded as we produced here at William & Mary the first Asian American play, my play, When the Purple Settles, when you're a professor here, you have the agency to direct your own play. <laughs> but you also have the agency to pick who will make the poster for your play. And I could not imagine of anyone else who could create an art piece that could also the capture, that could also capture the experience of the Filipino-American experience that I was trying to evoke in my play. And that was then senior at VCU, Roberto Hamora. So the poster for the play was actually the first original work of art that Roberto Hamora created that was on display at William and Mary in 2009. Well, fast forward many years later, and I encounter him this time as an artist whose, whose work belongs in esteemed collections of the Atlanta Hawks, of banks, multi-billion dollar banks, billionaire collectors in Atlanta, in New York, represented in Chicago and New York. Why is he, out of all the national Asian American artists now prominent, the distinguished Asian Centennial Fine Arts Fellow here? Because he belongs to Virginia. Because he is local to the Hampton Roads. My colleague, Professor Sohoni, and I were looking for an artist who could help us document, express artistically, not only the Asian American experience, but distinctly the Asian Pacific Islander, Middle Eastern, Southwest Asian experience in the Hampton Roads and then in Virginia. He has the heart of the Hampton Roads. He is a local boy, right? He is as local as Virginia Beach, as Richmond, as Broad Street, and now, very proudly, he is local to Williamsburg and William and Mary. Welcome to the tribe. I present to you Roberto Hamora our Asian Centennial Distinguished Artist. Thank you so much, uh, Francis, my brother. Thank you very much, David, for your uh, very warm introduction. 
Uh, just give me one sec. I'm going to uh, set up my notes here. Um, got it. Just want to make sure my uh, laptop doesn't cut out during the presentation. So I'm going to just switch the browser here, and then we'll get started in a second. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you to William and Mary, the Muscarelli Museum of Art, my brothers Francis Tangalagua, Steve Prince, Dinesh Sahoni. You all are true mountain movers. Thank you for showing me radical hospitality and inviting me to create on campus in your home. David Brashear, Melissa Paris, Laura Fogarty, and Kevin Gilliam, thank you for making inclusion in the museum real. Your support is leaving a long lasting legacy, not for me, but for all of us. Professor Brian Credatis, Michael Drager, and the whole art department, you all are very special educators and it has been a privilege to work in your midst. Special shout out to the fabulous students, Ella Goldschmidt and Sarah Wicker, and also Gabrielle Credatis, uh, yes, Professor Credatis' daughter, uh, for helping me out with the print edition that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, it has been really great chatting with all of you, uh, getting to learn more about your work um, and your aspirations. Nothing but love to my Filipino diaspora students um, from spring 21 here at William & Mary APIA. Uh, so great to see some of you in person for the first time. Um, we had a real journey last semester. Um, we faced a lot together and we were there for each other. Um, it's, it was so uh, transformative and I'm, I'm undoubtedly gonna carry that experience with me uh, for all of my days. And uh, thank you to my students from VCU Arts who are here. Uh, including Corey and Andy, my studio assistant. Uh, and of course, thank you to my parents who are visiting from Virginia Beach uh, for supporting my creative um, endeavors. And the biggest of thank yous to my rock, my support, the love of my life, my wife, Casey Johnson Hamura. So yeah, my name is uh, Roberto Hamura. This is a picture of me in my studio. I'm the William & Mary Asian Centennial Distinguished Fine Arts Fellow. I have a lot of titles. Uh, I'm also the Muscarelli Museum artist in residence right now, um, and I'm also an artist and educator. I'm uh, based in Richmond, Virginia. Um, uh, also a cat dad, too, if you want to add that on there. But uh, I am an assistant professor of art foundations at uh, Virginia Commonwealth School of the Arts, my alma mater. And I really feel like um, it's a privilege to, in like almost every day of my life, I get to help students make uh, work, artwork that is significant to them and to the community, and I get to um, see artwork um, for most of my waking hours um, as my labor. Um, and um, this is the painting that the Muscarelli acquired, uh, which I'm super duper um, thrilled about. Uh, it's called The Sound of Fate Knocking at the Door too. I put a bunch of pictures of this in my presentation. Uh, I didn't realize it was gonna be wheeled out here over, <laughs> which is great, so uh, thank you for that. Um, but the title of this piece, um, well, I guess I'll talk about the materials first. Um, the materials of this piece uh, are acrylic and pumice medium on canvas over panel. It's part of my uh, series called An Inventory of Traces, uh, which I'm gonna talk about in more detail a little later on. I'm really going to, in my talk, encapsulate my experience at William & Mary thus far, which has been quite extraordinary in working with the students um, doing my own uh, artistic research um, and also my own uh, creative art practice. But the title of this painting uh, is inspired by uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, the most iconic four notes in uh, the history of music, in my opinion. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, and whether this is true or not, I just took a screenshot from the Carnegie Hall website today. Um, those first four notes are supposed to sound like the sound of fate knocking at the door. Um, Anton Schindler, one of Beethoven's early biographers, had a tendency to kind of embellish certain truths. Um, but whether it's truth or fiction, I think that the myth is certainly significant. And I think um, as artists, we're kind of like myth makers in a way. 
Um, so when I think about uh, color, I really think about the everyday. I think the, um, about the magic of the everyday. Um, this is my wife, in, in, uh, and in, <laughs> she's cracking up over here. But um, this picture actually does have to do with the painting. If you notice the colors on the right, and then you look at the painting, it's all there. Um, I'm amazed by color, the power of color. I think so much of my life has been shaped by color. Uh, being a person of color, we used to be called colored. Uh, global South, um, developing world, third world. Um, all of this has been shaped by race and ethnicity to some degree. Um, so I find when uh, color to me reminds me of memories, that it's a profound experience that helps um, solidify those memories in my mind and in my heart. So I really think uh, this is the day we were moving from New York uh, to Virginia. And this was this uh, f like really old, like mid-century Formica terrible elevator. And we were exhausted because one of the task rabbit folks we hired didn't show up. <laughs> um, and really the everyday, this is, these are two really amazing artists. When I was in residence at um, the Joan Mitchell Foundation Center in uh, New Orleans, this is Marin Hassinger and Stacy Lynn Waddell. So when I see color, you know, I really love um, when, especially the color of uh, black indigenous and people of color, their skin tones are elevated and um, shown with power. Um, uh, New Orleans is a site for me, a place that was a big turning point in my kind of um, research as an artist. I, sp I did a three month residency there, like I mentioned, and when I was there, um, Fats Domino had passed away and I, I just loved how bombastic his house and he drove this uh, pink Cadillac around. Um, so thinking about color in these kind of everyday ways. So this is the sound of fate knocking at the door. I lived in New York for nine years after undergrad. Two weeks after I graduated from, with my BFA, I, I had $300 and I drove my hatch back to New York City. And then I finally felt like I could leave New York City and be an artist uh, and, and, and what that means to me, I'm going to share later on. But that's what this painting was about. Um, I wanted to kind of highlight these moments where I was, felt like I was ready for like the next moment in my life to reveal itself to me. But we're gonna move on and talk about the idea of observation. It's actually quite integral uh, in my work, even though I work in abstraction. I think everything I do is kind of um, allegorical to some degree, whether it's to a person, a place, uh, a work of art, uh, an idea. Um, but you know, one of the things I do, I work with first year art school students who will end up going into uh, design, sculpture, fashion design, uh, painting and so forth. And uh, in fact, uh, Andy over here, who um, is one of my uh, former students and now uh, works with me from time to time, uh, he asked me a question. He was like, why do you teach observational drawing? You're an abstract painter. Why, why, do, you, why do you find that there's significance there? And then I actually, um, it, it was a really great conversation and I, I really felt and I feel this way today that abstraction is actually observational. That in addition to depicting the visual world, uh, I believe material process and conceptually based abstraction can show how we observe the materials of material, uh, the, how we observe the material, the behaviors of materials, um, color, movement, metaphysics, and phil philosophy. So I work with a lot of really gifted students. So I'm just gonna go through these very quickly. Um, but we um, think of observation in a very innovative ways. And when I think of observation, I just think of focused seeing, critical thinking. So we go, we do a little bit of everything. And being in Richmond, our, um, our foundation building is two blocks from all the monuments on Monument Avenue. So um, in, in teaching perspective drawing, um, my students are tasked with uh, the prompt of, you know, artists design these monuments that are then uh, put into the public sphere. And, you know, artists will be the ones who reclaim those spaces uh, for um, the, the public. So we celebrate black joy and black and brown unity, and we give uh, reverence to those who have been lost uh, in this, uh, and the racist killings. Uh, we work um, and we're, we make really ambitious drawings that are conceptually based while also technically uh, advanced. Um, 
usually my students are about halfway through the semester by the time they start making um, these very rigorous um, charcoal drawings that measure three by four feet approximately. We get weird over there at <laughs> VCU Arts for sure. Yeah. So I'll just go through these. They're so good that I could spend all day like singing my students' praises. Yeah, it's a drawing. <laughs> but yeah, observation is part of my vision. And I think observation is difficult. Um, we're we're distracted all the time. In fact, I, I delete social media from my phone Monday through Friday <laughs> so that I can focus on what's important. Um, and one of the things I've been doing um, in my time here, I've been here since Monday, uh, working on an art project that I'm gonna talk to you all about, is, uh, is observing the space, learning about uh, the APM experience here. I've been in the special collections. I've been riding my bike around town. Some of you may have seen me around. Um, but one of the things I did the other morning was I went to the James River and I created this, what I call a video sketch. I'm not a video artist, I used to. Um, when I started art school, I wanted to be a film major. And then when I told my parents that I wanted to be a painter, um, they were like, you should double major in film so you can get a job. But luckily it all worked out. <laughs> but I think um, as we transition to kind of, I'm about to talk about the Asian centennial, I think um, this is a good moment to kind of change the kind of tone of, not tone, but like um, the kind of pace of this uh, presentation. So I'm gonna play this video I made the other day. So yeah, I just, I made that video the other day. Um, let me exit out of here to make it full screen. To think about the passing of time, because we are celebrating 100 years. Um, and uh, I'm gonna bring into the room Pu Kao Chen and Pu Kao Chen's story, which I was um, very fortunate to hear of um, because of the centennial and through Francis, uh, Professor Aguas. So, pardon me. And I also wanted to say a big thank you to Brian Zhao, Sumie, uh, Yotsukura, Professor Sohoni, and Kate Hoving at Swim Library Special Collections for finding and sharing this with Francis, who shared this with me. Um, Pukau Chen um, was the first 
person of color as we as, as far as we know right now who attended the College of William and Mary, and he was also a great writer. Um, in this uh, passage from uh, before this passage in liter uh, William and Mary Literary Magazine, he re chronicles his his journey from Angel Island all the way to William and Mary. Well, I don't want to read the entire um, article. Certainly, that wouldn't be the best use of our time. I think um, to think about what what Pu Kao Chen was facing in in uh, 1921 um, is unfortunately familiar sounding and feeling. We did not see much of Chicago, but we did see the smoke and some of the dusty streets belonging to a big city. As soon as I arrived at my destination and alighted from the train with another fellow who was to go to the same college with me, we were presently hailed Chinaman, Chinaman. From behind, I do not know by whom, but decidedly to our great discomfiture. It often troubles me, especially in those days of my mental depression, to think that great as the American civilization is, there should still be a small fraction of the people who seem to think China a somewhat barbaric country and her citizens an unruly set of people, or as it were, a mass of anti-Diluvian men. So indeed, xenophobia and hate persist today. But there is progress. And um, one of the things that I um, came across when I was at SWEM Special Collections was the um, box of documents from the Filipino American Student Association here. Um, I'm also very active in, I was very active in my student association at VCU and I'm uh, the faculty advisor for our um, Filipino student organization up there. Um, but, and then I knew Anthony Alopre, who's I'm quoting here. Um, uh, and I was I was really fascinated by this correspondence because although I knew Anthony, I didn't really kind of uh, talk to him a lot. Um, just I guess geographically, our cross paths didn't cross that often. But I felt like I was feeling this last paragraph, um, which I'll read. To state the situation bluntly, people need an incentive to learn. The obvious incentive for not learning is knowledge. But if the teachers are college students themselves and the students are busy with their own college homework, then there is little we can do to motivate them to sacrifice their time and effort for informal lessons from underqualified teachers. And Anthony is talking about, um, about um, the Filipino students teaching themselves Filipino American studies. Um, he goes on to say, so why don't we just get a department of Filipino studies at every Virginia school, which I think would be awesome. <laughs> Well, I actually think that is a great idea, but even if we did have a Department of Filipino Studies, uh, there would still be a need to study abroad. And this was from August of 2008. And I think that this is so amazing that if we look back even just 13 years, how far we've come, there's an Asian Pacific Islander American Studies program here at William & Mary, and I think we should all clap for that. Thank you. Which brings me to my really amazing students that I taught um, last past spring. I just blocked out their names to, um, to safeguard their privacy and stuff. Uh, it was kind of a game time decision to include this, but I think one of the things uh, we did was um, in this decolonization process was to reclaim our roots. And one of those things that we did, uh, one of these exercises was to um, learn how to write in the pre-colonial Filipino um, script called Babayan, also known as Alibata. Um, and there's a lot of different handwriting systems within the archipelago. Um, this is just one for the Tagalog region, which I'll talk about what that word means later on. But for me, it was very um, liberating to do this. And I, and I just remember feeling like when I saw the screen of Zoom, because this class was online because of the pandemic, like how special that experience was to see our pre-colonial um, handwriting on the screen, all of us participating in something together. So I designed a bunch of uh, art projects because I'm not a historian, I'm not a sociologist, and yet I'm teaching Filipino diaspora studies. Um, I approached it from the viewpoint of an artist. So we approached um, the diasporic experience uh, through the arts. Uh, and I mean that broadly. We watched films, looked at paintings, made drawings, graphic design uh, projects, uh, assemblages, and, uh, and zines. So here are some of the kind of uh, negative and positive space typography kind of exercises I did with the students. Um, these are some demos I made to uh, think about um, the idea of the Balik Bayan box, which I'll talk about in more detail in a second. But um, we learned a little bit of Photoshop. We learned how to compose compositions using found objects. 
Um, and basically, I mentioned the word Balak Bayan box, but Balak Bayan boxes are what we in the diaspora uh, send to our families back home in the Philippines um, to give them sustenance, to give them gifts, to show our love. And indeed, we, we dealt with a lot last semester, so this was kind of a tribute to uh, the souls that were lost in Atlanta. But yeah, we did a lot. And um, one of our last projects was the Community Mobilization Project, um, which I inherited because of uh, Professor Agwas over here. And I, I really loved the idea of an interdisciplinary uh, culminating uh, synthesizing pro project that, would, uh, that students would be able to design their own research. Um, some of the examples I showed were zine making and also doing an oral history project um, with my dad over Zoom here on the top right. Um, and um, in this whole decolonization process, we looked at poetry as well. And I think um, one of the things about my work uh, is the reveal, it's the unveiling. And um, on the first day of class, I got permission from my friend Michelle Penaloza to read this poem to you all. Um, it's from this book called Former Possessions of the Spanish Empire. And I, and I say there's this, unre this revealing because you know, obviously, I'm Southeast Asian. My name is Spanish, um, and there's a reason for that. Our names carry the story. Former possessions of the Spanish Empire. People name us with a separation of their teeth, the long Z of our naming. It used to be we were named for our proximity, Kato Taping Dagat, the parentage of the sea, the forest lineage, Kato Ginubatan, or we were named for our parents, Anak ni Lina, Bunso ni Boyet. The song of our names led to the discovery of garlic growing from our palms, the scapes forming a second green hand, but it was in the name of good King Philip that songs changed to names and the naming of names became law. A governor general made a name for himself with the catalogo de apellidos, a dissemination of empire, a naming of parts to trace and tax everyone, Whole provinces renamed with efficient alphabetical phenomena, Padilla, Pacheco, Palma, Paz, Perez, Portillo, Puente, Peñaloza. Still, there were names we kept to ourselves, a shorthand between us, windows lined with votives, jars of holy water, the papaya's lush coral and beaded seeds, shining fish row. Can legacy exist in shorthand? Papal, papa, papel, papaya, Pa'alam, permission, please. What are the root words for what we simply know? How do children born of empire once removed possess the history of their naming? Thank you for the snaps. Um, and so hence uh, the decolonization aspect of Filipino diaspora, indeed. Um, because I think it's an unpacking of everything, our names. Um, what we do, why our people are in the situation that they're in. But in the studio, uh, it is not just gloom and doom, certainly. Um, one of my favorite artists ever who, um, who really inspires so much of the work that I do is Jack Wynn. And in, in this uh, video interview he did titled Mapping the Soul, he says, I have an insistence on having fun with my painting. As an abstract painter, I work with things I cannot see. Google has mapped the whole earth. We have maps of Mars. So we've done a lot of mapping. We do not have a map of the soul, and that intrigues me. I can't see the soul, I can feel it though. So before I get to kind of how that kind of uh, manifests in my work, uh, I did mention Bai Bai Yin, um, which is the pre-colonial lang uh, written language of my people. And the Bai Bai Yin letter for Ka, which signifies unity between people when added to certain words, Kapatid, sibling, kasama, comrade, Kaibigan, friend, kababayan, compatriot. Uh, this is expressed through two wavy lines. Some say represents rivers and are connected by a bridge, uh, which makes sense because all of these words deal with relationships between multiple people. The symbol is also used by the uh, Katipunan, which was the revolutionary group against the Spanish and then the Americans uh, during the Philippine-American War. So I created this painting um, uh, with assistance uh, uh, with uh, Andy Mazzella over here, um, called A Bridge Connecting Two Rivers, and it's four by five feet. 
And basically what you're seeing here, and I'd like to introduce this painting just because I feel like it kind of uh, synthesizes a lot of what I do. And um, it's acrylic and pumice medium on a jigsaw panel. So it's like two puzzle pieces fitting together. So two disparate pieces of wood. But the one part that uh, intersects these two pieces of wood are these skin tones of Filipino people I know, people I love, um, that join these two worlds. Hence the connecting of the rivers. But what am I doing here? I'm here to make works of art in conversation with the APM community at William and Marion to celebrate 100 years of Asian students at the college. Um, so here's a list of what I'm doing, and I'm very efficient at this part, but uh, I'm making two print editions. They're gonna be silk screened. Uh, one's in progress. You'll see some of the in progress shots. One for the Muscarelli Museum of Art, and we're gonna be unveiling that in November. And then another print uh, edition for the APIA Studies Program. I'm gonna be making a large mixed media piece, uh, and I'm also going to be expanding the design of the Asian Pacific Islander and Middle Eastern commencement stole. Uh, and my very last project will be a self portrait about my time at the college, so something that is very reflective about my experience with you all. Um, but I just want to give a, a definitely a shout out to Professor Shihai for sharing research about the hot tub with Francis, uh, who shared it with me. Um, I just wanted to show you all, because I'm in the early stages of the research for this project that I'm doing in collaboration um, with pres uh, current students, alumni, and faculty at William & Mary. Um, for this tradition that we are gonna build upon. Um, we are looking at different textiles from all parts of Asia, Southwest Asia, Middle East, uh, like the kata, which is a Tibetan uh, scarf that is traditionally given to you as a gift when you arrive or when you depart to um, wish you safe travels, um, which is fitting um, because graduation is uh, bidding you adieu from the college. The alam pai here is the um, traditional um, University of the Philippines graduation stole, which is actually more of a sash that also includes that babayin, um, the indigenous or the pre-colonial um, written language that you see here, uh, and the hata, which is a Palestinian um, textile. And some of the things that we are thinking about, we've only started meeting two weeks ago, but that um, we want this. Um, commencement stole to feel, to look organic and feel personalized because that reflects the community here uh, at William & Mary. We want a garment that could be worn outside of the graduation and things that we don't wanna do is appropriate. We don't wanna just take somebody else's design and just recreate it and take um, credit for that. I'm really thinking about um, innovation and how we can be inspired but not just take um, from from other cultures, so really creating something new and something specific um, to our community here at William & Mary. So in the future, there may be, uh, there's likely going to be a stamping event where I create a wood block that is pressed onto these um, stoles, um, customized for the students, of course. More on that later. But I've been uh, really um, having a blast at Matoka Art Studio. Um, it's really a great space um, if you haven't had a, a, a chance to go out there uh, and work with the art department. Um, there's so many great students over there. And um, like I mentioned before, uh, Professor Craig Dennis, uh really such a, uh, a treat to be around you and your students um, and helping me out with this print. So uh, I've been here for a week and a half. I'm producing a 50 print edition, so it's no easy task. I'm really working late into the night, but I printed this test print here. Um, it's the silkscreen process, so I'm pulling ink through a stencil, essentially. Uh, and I'm gonna be gifting one of these small prints to the studio. Um, but it's been a blast. Uh, it's been kind of an assembly line, which has been fun. We're just like kind of chatting it up while we have these like, uh, what Steve Prince uh, calls uh, a dance in the studio, which I feel like is very uh, appropriate for the process. It feels like a workshop, it feels, um, it feels great to, to labor in the shop for sure. Here's more prints of us, or more photos of us printing in the studio. Um, you can see kind of a preview of what the print is going to look like. There's gonna be lots of color. It's 100% the most, um, the most uh, ambitious print I've ever made in my life. There's just so many layers, and I feel like I just want to give reverence to the space and to the people uh, as I create this work of art that deals with. Um, uh, rivers, the likeness of the first three Asian students, um, Pukau Chen, uh, art 
uh, Artmatsu and uh, Hatsuye Yamasaki. And also the three flowers that represent um, the Asian community here, the lotus, the jasmine, uh, and the hibiscus. So here's some really great in process work. It's uh, been loads of fun. There's a uh, Michael Drager back there. who has been really super helpful. Uh, but yeah, it's been a blast. It's been busy. I've been trying to keep the place clean. <laughs> Cause uh, yeah, it could be really messy. But why art? I feel like we all like experience art wherever we go. This room is designed by an architect. There's paintings everywhere. We watch Netflix. Um, uh, filmmakers created what we experience. Um, and I think it's important for us to like, think about like why art, what is the creative process. And one of the texts that I signed on the first day of uh, most of my classes, Andy had to read this when he was in my class a couple years ago, uh, is D James Baldwin's The Creative Process. Perhaps the primary distinction of the artist is that he must actively cultivate that state which most men necessarily, and I do apologize, I think it, this was written in 1962, so the use of pronouns is not very inclusive. Um, but I think the sentiment of this, um, this reading is very um, valuable. Um, the state which most men necessarily must avoid, the state of being alone. That all men, when the chips are down, are down alone is a banality, a banality because it is very frequently stated, but very rarely on the evidence believed. Most of us are not compelled to linger with the knowledge of our aloneness, for it is a knowledge that can paralyze all action in the world. There are forever swamps to be drained, cities to be created, mines to be exploited, children to be fed. None of these things can be done alone, but the conquest of the physical world is not man's only duty. He is also enjoined to conquer the great wilderness of himself. The pre precise role of the artist then is to illuminate that darkness, blaze roads through the vast forest so that we will not in all our doing lose sight of its purpose, which is after all to make the world a more human dwelling place, which I always thought was a very powerful um, impetus to make art, to make the world a more d human dwelling place. He goes on to say, we are the strongest nation in the world, but not for the reasons that we think. And I think that's, is very optimistic for 1962 coming from a gay black man. It is because we have an opportunity that no other nation has in moving beyond the old world concepts of race and class and caste to create finally what we must have had in mind when we first began speaking of the new world. But the price of this is a long looking backward when we came and an unflinching assessment of the record. For an artist, the record of that journey is most clearly revealed in the personalities of the people the journey produced. Societies never know it, but the war of an artist with his society is a lover's war, and he does at his best what lovers do, which is to reveal the beloved to himself, and with that revelation, to make freedom real. It's a good ass line. No, oh, pardon me, <laughs> sorry. Um, but I believe uh, that the studio should be a place where you can dance and also weep, so I wanted to just share this video as we segue to the next spot. I shared this with my students last semester. I think they got a kick out of it. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm gonna just chat quickly, and there's not, hopefully not as many slides left, but um, obviously I have a connection to the Philippines that is palpable through my parents, certainly, who birthed me into this planet. Um, but I traveled to the Philippines as an undergrad. I studied there, which was, which was really a, a wonderful experience, um, a very transformative one. Um, and that experience really influenced a lot of the representational paintings I was making in undergrad. Um, this painting is called Balakbay in Boxes That Never Left. And um, it's a diorama of my parents' garage, which is seemingly a repository of me and my three other siblings' stuff and stuff we wanted to send to the Philippines. And um, over time, I wanted to kind of deconstruct um, a very cohesive image in space into, uh, and bringing abstraction into representation. So I, I feel like now that I've been you know, working artist for so long, I can start to see over time how my work has evolved. 
And then here's another piece called Palimpsest, which is four by five feet, um, hanging in my parents' living room. <laughs> um, dealing with the uh, rice terraces of the Philippines, Balak Bayan boxes, and the idea of movement and um, the nature of images as the form on the bottom left is repeated on the top right. Which leads me to where I'm at now in my, progress, in my, in my process here. My body of work is called the Inventory of Traces. Um, I always talk about this work because it's such a significant piece uh, for me. It's a collaboration between Byron Kim and Glenn Ligon, um, a black artist and a Korean American artist. Um, and basically what you're seeing here is um, two grids, 16 um, panels each. Um, one side of the, the total of 32 um, uh, uh, panels is uh, all of the paints at an art supply store at the time that were considered flesh tones, which as we know are limited as in this demonstration here. And then all of the pigments on the left are the different black um, pigments. So even through just color, we can get a, a sense of a narrative of history of how there's inequities even in the materials that we use. And this is, um, I, I wouldn't, I got to give props to uh, pa Pamela and William Royal, our big supporters of the arts in Richmond, and um, they gifted this to the Smithsonian American, uh, uh, American Art Museum. But I talked about New Orleans a little. I talked about New Orleans at the little, a little bit at the beginning of my talk, and I spent a considerable amount of time there. Um, and here's my studio at the Joan Mitchell Center. And when I was there, I, I got a rental car and I drove to distant parts of. Um, uh, and I'm forgetting the names of the parishes, uh, which are like the municipalities um, in Louisiana. But Harper's Weekly in 1883 uh, published a story about this um, Filipino vil fishing village, which was really unusual for the time, that had been there for about 50 years in the remote bayous of uh, Louisiana. So I went out there because you know, I, I, I think there's magic in the everyday. Uh, and I just wanted to go there at different times of the day, in the morning, at sunrise midday when it was extremely hot and during sunset because I wanted to see like when my ancestors woke up what was their visual experience like oh yeah Jean Lafitte and it's a really amazing place um, you know lotuses grow in the swamp um, they need that kind of uh, that kind of circle of life that happens within a, a, a swamp which is just a flooded forest Things are t constantly kind of eating each other. There's kind of these dangers. There's bugs, there's gators and stuff like that. And that's how I translated that into this painting. So thinking purely of the color of the space and how I can direct the light for the viewer to think of moments where the land has really um, become meaningful for the viewer. Thinking about different waterways. This is the uh, waterway called Bayou St. Malo. Um, that leads to where the village used to be. And it's along the banks of Lake Bourne outside of uh, New Orleans. I think a lot about painting in um, especially um, BIPOC um, abstract painters, uh, especially when painting is in minor situations. So this book is, uh, I had to read several passages from this book when I was in graduate school, but high times, hard times. And this book really introduced me to Jack Wynn's work, um, who is a black painter from um, Louisiana, who um, was really kind of traumatized by the civil rights uh, movement after being like in the protests and being um, subject to violence. Um, studying art in New York was uh, a really important uh, next step for Jack Whitten. And during this time when pop art and minimalism was taking over kind of the art world, um, painting was in this minor kind of position. Painting lives and dies. Uh, depending on the year, but uh, what I loved about Jack Wynn's work was he was doing really innovative things that people really started to do later on, but I feel like Jack Wynn really took, really did it first. Like he was the first, like, I feel like this was before Gerhard Richter was um, squeegeeing oil paint across canvases, Jack Wynn was doing this in the 70s. And um, no worries. Uh, but uh, another thing about Jack Wynn as his work progressed, one of his, um, my, my, my favorite period of his work from the 80s until his death in 2018 
was the Black Monolith series, uh, which is a series of paintings about black people who have contributed a lot to society, locating the essence of that person and that person becoming a symbol, which Jack Witten builds into the paint. So this one is Black Monolith uh, 10, The Birth of Muhammad Ali, 2016. Essence is hard to capture. Uh, and when I was at this residency once, I was moving my squeegee around my canvas, and I think my wife had called me and interrupted the process, which was great, because uh, I love speaking with my wife, obviously. But um, it created this uh, marbling effect on this particular canvas, and when I saw this, I, uh, I, I was immediately taken back to Jack Witten's um, squeegee paintings, um, which he calls the developer uh, uh, tool. So um, as an homage to Jack Witten, I titled this painting Firstborn Homage to Jack Witten because I felt like I could have never made this painting had he not made his. And compositionally, I think I tell my students all the time, composition is everywhere, whether you're a sculptor, a graphic designer, a fashion designer. Um, but you know, where these compositions come from um, can be inspired from anything, from art history, from you know, looking at an iPhone app. But this is Michelangelo's Creation of Adam at the Sistine Chapel. And I really love that negative space, that space that is um, between the subject of the art here, between the fingers. I think this is an iconic kind of view of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Um, that really inspired the kind of tension that's created with the two incisions in this painting. So I think with very little information I'm trying to deliver to the viewer, I think there's a lot um, that can happen here. Which brings me to this series. In thinking also about um, symbols, uh, and how we can capture the essence of somebody. This is um, when I really started to think about how I can make abstraction related to other people. At this time, um, I renamed the series I was working on to uh, An Inventory of Traces, which is actually taken from a quote in Edward Said's book, Orientalism, where he writes, in many ways, my study of Orientalism has been an attempt to inventory the traces upon me, the Oriental subject of the culture whose domination has been so powerful a factor in the life of all Orientals. So through abstraction, I wanted to celebrate the lives of immigrants. So I got this little grant from, um, from the Rima Hortman Foundation to uh, meet with immigrant artists and writers in New York to learn about the traces the world has left upon them and to just have conversations about color uh, since color has uh, impacted our lives so much uh, in terms of race and ethnicity. So their stories inspired the color composition and literal traces of several of the paintings for which I am so grateful. And here are some installation views. And the exhibition took place at Topaz Arts, uh, which is in Woodside, Queens, which um, pretty much every immigrant uh, <laughs> community has a, a spot there, a store, a restaurant, which is beautiful. Um, and, but this one painting I want to highlight is called Joan Carries All of This at the Women's March in conversation with my dear friend Joan Aria Tehine. Um, 44 by 36 inches, oil and beeswax on canvas, 2018. So basically Joan, um, uh, as a dear friend of mine, we were roommates, and um, for a period of time, she was undocumented and a single mother, and she's um, a big activist in the uh, transnational feminist community in uh, New York and New Jersey, and she shared with me all of her stories. I know her son, and um, she was um, showing me pictures of her and her comrades marching through the streets of uh, Washington, D.C., and um, thinking about um, this land that she couldn't touch anymore, the Philippines. She couldn't go back to the Philippines and then come back to the United States. Um, she's from Pampanga, Philippines, which are, is where Professor Aguas is from, and this middle incision in the canvas is the shape of a waterway near her hometown, and there's skin tones of her son and her, her as a child, and the places that she um, remembers um, but can't really go back to. Now, everything's all gravy now, but I think for a while um, um, she was really going through a lot. And I was happy to share this painting in Miami at the Frost Art Museum um, a couple of years ago. So here are just some installation views. And in fact, you can't see this super well, but the painting on the right is a Jack Witten painting. So this is a paint, this is an exhibition curated by Amy Galpin, inspired by um, cut abstraction using Jack Witten's work as a starting point. Artists like Sam Gilliam and, um, and Howard Dina Pendel were in the exhibition as well. So I, um, basically all of my heroes of, of abstract painting so I mentioned that a formative experience of mine was studying abroad in the Philippines, um, you know, reclaiming um, 
you know, in the diaspora, it was, it was so, back in the day, even hard to connect, but I felt like having this immersion program where I was studying at the University of the Philippines, but also um, going out into the communities, like um, uh, uh, immersing myself in fishing, poor fishing communities, going on these trips, learning uh, indigenous dances um, was really important to me. And I think it was important to my identity formation as a young person. I met Francis after this experience, so I felt like there was so much you know, for me to unpack that I didn't really have many people to do that with. Um, Francis was one of those people. Um, but unfortunately, you know, um, I think we've all lost something, some people, people we loved during the pandemic, and I, I lost like three people that are dear to me. But um, one of uh, the great educators of my life <clears throat> who uh, lived under the dictatorship of Marcos in the Philippines passed last summer. And I uh, shared her writings with my Filipino diaspora students. And I think uh, they really knew that I was struggling with loss. They were there for me. So thank you. I cry really easily. <laughs> uh, I feel like uh, so much goes into these paintings. Thank you, brother. But I wanted to commemorate this experience I had, you know, going back and studying and, and transforming my life um, by returning to my roots. So I wanted to capture the skin tones of, um, of folks that I love, my comrades here. So I created this uh, painting called Kayumangi, which is the Filipino word for, that describes the skin of Filipino people. And um, there's four incisions people could see those as wounds uh, into the skin, um, but they're little kind of apertures into these transformative times in my life, in my life and to, in the lives of uh, my friends. So there's only one, like two more slides left. Uh, this is second to last, but um, you know, before Mag Magellan came to the Philippines 500 years ago this year, I was reminded by Professor Aguas <laughs> Um, and thank you, brother. Appreciate it. And uh, before Magellan was trying to circumnavigate the globe, we were sailing around Southeast Asia all the way to Madagascar on our uh, balangays, which are our boats uh, that we were traveling using the stars to navigate. Um, and like that painting I shared earlier, that was about. Um, a bridge connecting two rivers. This is called Barangay, which basically translates into village based on um, our pre-colonial um, boats that we would sail throughout the seas. And as you can see here, we see the skin tones of brown people traversing these two disparate pieces of wood um, connecting the rivers again. And that's the sound of fate knocking on the door, folks. Knock, knock. Thank you, everybody.